Hello everyone, thanks very much for joining us and uh, welcome. My name is Dan Headley, I'm a partner in our uh, commercial contracts team and if we could click onto the next slide please. I'm joined today by Hannah Clipston, our Head of Commercial Litigation, by Andrew Walker who heads up our restructuring and insolvency team and by Catherine Robinson, an associate in the commercial contracts team with me. Uh, First things first, we need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, firstly, interactive is good. We don't want to just be talking heads for an hour. So if you want to ask questions, that is a very, very good thing to do. Uh, the way to do it is if you hover your mouse over the main show window, then you'll find a little toolbar pops up. And towards the right hand side of that toolbar, there are a couple of speech bubbles uh, with a little question mark in. If you click on that, it'll bring up a Q&A box into which you can type your questions and uh, our moderators will grab those and get them to us. Uh, we're going to speak for about 45 minutes total, I think, and then we'll save the last 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can in the time we have. If we don't get to you, uh, if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to leave your name and email, we can come back to you offline later. Um, other than that, we are recording this, uh, so there will be recording available if you have to drop off and you want to catch the rest of it for any reason, or indeed if you want to share it with your colleagues or friends, please do. Um, and I should explain, since I'm on camera, that I am sporting this, this ridiculous facial topiary, uh, and, and the reason for it is that it is Movember, uh, a month in which uh, men who can't run away from the recruiting gangs fast enough uh, are asked to grow preposterous facial hair to raise money for men's health charities. Uh, and since it is also by coincidence uh, International Men's Day today, uh, we will at the end also post a link into the chat where if you wish, you're under no obligation to do so, but if you wish, you can click through and, and make a donation to those charities. Um, and please do because uh, I haven't made myself look this silly on a webinar in front of several hundred people uh, for, for my health. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Today we're looking at, at B2B contracts uh, and specifically we're looking at three sort of buckets of stuff. Um, the first area, which uh, Hannah and I are going to cover between us, uh, concerns some of the more interesting or significant or illuminating court decisions that we've had over the last year or so. Uh, we'll then hand over to Catherine, who will uh, take us through the platform to business regulations, which are the, the major piece of legislation that nobody's heard of. Uh, and then we will hand over to Andrew, who will take us through some of the recent changes to the Insolvency Act and what that means for your options if someone you're in a contract with gets into financial difficulties. Uh, I should say at the outset that this is not going to be terribly relevant to consumer contracts. Uh, consumer contracts are highly regulated. They've got their own legal regime, now largely found in the Consumer Rights Act. Uh, and it's not going to be terribly relevant to employment contracts either for, for much the same reason. So here we're really talking about contracts between businesses. And while this is a little bit of a rag bag, uh, next slide please. There is something of a unifying theme to it all, which is that, you know, there's a very traditional view of, of our, our law of contract, which is that when you're talking about dealings between businesses, then unless there's some sort of vitiating factor like duress or mistake or whatever, that you can make more or less whatever bargain you want to. And the law is not going to rescue you if that bargain is unfair uh, or foolish or, or just plain doesn't work. Now, that's become less and less true over the years and, and the pace at which that is becoming less true seems to be accelerating. Um, as Hannah and I are going to talk about in a minute, uh, we, we've seen a real uptick in judicial willingness to fix bad or dysfunctional or unfair business deals uh, through tools like implying terms into them uh, or through applying tests of business efficacy when interpreting them or even through 
introducing wholly novel doctrines like good faith. Uh, equally, we've seen an awful lot of uh, statutory intervention, and that, that's not new in itself. We've got the, you know, that's been the case for 100 years. We've had the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act, UCTA, the Supply of Goods and Services Act, etc., etc., but it is very much on the increase. Freedom of contract is, in the traditional classical sense of it, is diminishing. Uh, and the thing is that the last couple of years, we've all perfectly justifiably been kind of looking at, at Brexit and then at COVID. And, and that doesn't mean that the rest of the legal world has stopped because it hasn't. So with that, if we could have the next slide, please. And then I will hand over to Hannah. Thanks, Sam. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to spend just the next five minutes or so taking you through some examples and reminders of the English court's recent approach to interpreting B2B contracts and also implying terms into express and all agreements. Um, Dan's already helpfully trailed for me. Um, the English court does have a stated reluctance to interfere with what businesses have agreed between themselves. But actually, we have a number of recent cases indicating that the court actually will consider intervening, implying terms and actually even severing terms from an agreement where the parties clearly intended to create legal relations. And also, more importantly, where it's required for reasons of business efficacy or in plain English to make the agreement work. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Before I dig into that piece, um, I'm just going to start by flagging um, the Nucleus and Reese case. Um, this case is in relation to electronic signatures um, and it contains a bit of a health warning about using automatic signature blocks on emails in the context particularly of any final contractual negotiations. So this case concerned the transfer of a piece of land um, under the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989 um, and this act requires a contract for property to be recorded in writing. In particular, the question that arose here was whether an automatically generated email footer which contained the name, uh, contact details of the solicitor for the defendant who was the sender of the relevant email constituted a signature for the purposes of the act. The court held that a name in the footer of an email amounted to the signature under the Act as long as the name was applied with authenticating intent. So in this case, it didn't make a difference that the details were added automatically um, or manually because actually the court was persuaded that the setting up of the rule in the first place, so that that rule of setting up your signature, involved the conscious action of someone and looked at objectively the presence of the name and the contact details put into that automatic signature indicated a clear intention to associate the author of the email and provide the required authenticating intent. It was also relevant here um, that what the solicitor had done had put the words many thanks before the automatic footer in his email and the court thought that this strongly suggested that the solicitor was relying on the automatic footer to sign off on his name. Although this case was determined within the very specific provisions of the Law of Property Act, it does serve as a reminder for us all um, of the importance of using subject to contract label on communications as appropriate. Although Another bit of warning here, even when this label is used, it will always be a complete bar to claiming that a binding contract has been formed, especially where you have the situation where parties have the intention to form a binding contractual relationship and the main elements of that relationship required to make the intended arrangement work or the business efficacy are also agreed. So having given a warning about using electronic signatures in the context of binding agreements, we'll now need to dig into the discussion around the interpretation of B2B contracts and where if a contract is silent on a particular area, a court may very well be prepared to imply terms to help deal with the situation and help the parties appropriately. Um, the first case referred to on the next slide, um, if we could please, is the Supreme Court decision in Marks and Spencers against BNB Paribas, uh, a case in 2015, but really the starting point of the most recent well-established case law on construction and interpretation of commercial arrangements, also setting out how and when the court will allow terms to be implied. We will dip into the other cases on this slide, but um, it's really important first for me to give you a summary of the test in Marks and Spencer's case, 
where the Supreme Court and in particular Lord Newberger took the opportunity to unanimously stick to his previous judgments, also in 2015, of Arnold and Britain and Cavendish and McDacy, um, and declared that it was really important to respect the bargain struck by parties in detailed commercial contracts. What Lord Newberger did was um, reiterate the test for implying terms as per the BP refinery case right back in 1977. Um, and just to give you a, a bit of a reminder of what the, that test actually was, um, first, that the proposed term uh, that must be reasonable and equitable, albeit that on its own, that wouldn't be sufficient, that the proposed term to be implied must be necessary to give business efficacy to the contract so that no term will be implied if the contract is effective without it. Uh, the third test is it must be so obvious that it goes without saying that the implied term should appear there. Fourthly, it must be capable of clear expression. And finally, it must not contradict any express terms of the contract. So from this case, um, you would be right to assume that it's really difficult to persuade a court to include implied terms into an express commercial contract. Um, and that the court would generally be reluctant to interfere with an express bargain entered into particularly between commercial parties. However, we fast forward to 2019 um, and this issue has come in front of our courts on a couple of occasions. And what the court has actually done, as, as Dan has quite rightly said, has taken the opportunity to highlight business efficacy as the main justification for a particular way of interpreting a contract um, and also for implying terms. I'm going to look at each of these cases in turn, but starting first with the Supreme Court's decision in Wells and Dufani. This case involved Mr Wells. He was a property developer and he was really struggling to sell the final seven properties in a property development. He got in touch with Mr Devani, an estate agent, um, and they held a telephone call uh, where they discussed the sale. And Mr Devani particularly confirmed that his commission on any sale would be 2%. Both parties acknowledged and agreed in subsequent proceedings that the trigger event for payment, which, as we all probably know, would be at completion, was not discussed during that call. Mr Devani introduced a buyer to Mr Wells, and once the sale had completed, I think somewhat inevitably, Mr Wells refused to pay Mr Devani his commission. At first instance, the court said the parties clearly had an intention to create legal relations and the law should imply a term that 2% commission was payable to, to Mr Devani at completion. Um, they based this on the, the reasonable buy standard test and said that no one would have disputed this had a reasonable buy standard suggested it. The Court of Appeal, however, disagreed and they said there was no agreement as the trigger event for payment and therefore this was fatal to the claim. The Supreme Court, however, stepped in and reversed its decision and held that the oral agreement between Mr Wells and Mr Devani was enforceable, despite the fact that they had not had a discussion on when the commission would be paid. In this case, the court said a reasonable person would have understood the parties to have meant for completion to trigger the right to payment, with the amount due being paid out of the proceeds of sale. Um, essentially, common sense. There are a couple of takeaways from this case uh, for me, however. Um, firstly, once an intention to create legal relations is found and it has been acted upon, the court will be really reluctant to find an agreement too vague to be enforced completely. There's clearly no bar to the court implying terms that are obviously necessary to give business efficacy to the agreement or to put it another way and also to use the words of Lord Newberger in the Marks and Spencers case to give Mr Wells and Mr Devani's agreement commercial or practical coherence. In this case, as a result, it was necessary to imply a term on the timing of the commission payment to give the party's arrangement practical coherence, effectively um, reverse an omission of the parties to make that agreement work. A reasonable person would have understood commission to be paid out of the proceeds of sale and as a result the contract was sufficiently certain and complete to be enforceable. I do want to however just introduce a slight word of caution here. Um, this case as is always the case turned on the facts in dispute um, and was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court with the associated cost of pursuing that appeal. Therefore, to minimise disputes and obviously the associated costs regarding enforceability and performance under a commercial contract, it's really important to ensure that all material terms are recorded in some way. 
preferably in a signed agreement um, before any work under that commercial agreement is carried out. Um, if we can turn to the next slide, please, um, and we're going to take a look at the case of Lehman versus Exotics Partners, um, also from last year, um, and also where the High Court applied a common sense interpretation to a contract for sale. In this case, both parties have been mistaken as to the quantity and value of the assets being sold. Um, the result was that assets worth over 7 million US dollars were accidentally sold for around only 7,500 US dollars, so um, a big mistake. However, the mistake was also amplified when the purchaser of the assets, realising the mistake, subsequently sold them on at full market value and made a substantial profit. The English court looking at the agreement held that based on the words used, um, and it, again, it was an oral contract um, over the telephone, the parties could not reasonably be, suppo be supposed to have agreed to sell and buy these assets at such a reduced price. So the court said instead, the party's objective intention here was to sell a number of the depository notes, which were the assets in question, 22.955 notes, for only 7,500 US dollars. The court also found that this correct interpretation required a term to be implied for business efficacy purposes in order to ensure that performance could actually take place. This term was that a fraction of a note, 0.955, was to be settled in cash because if they hadn't have implied this term, it was the only way the agreement could work. This implied term was not obvious, so that was one of the strands I mentioned earlier in the BP refinery case. However, it had to be implied by the court on the basis that without it, the contract simply would lack any commercial or indeed practical coherence. You may think that this decision provides some assistance should you be on the wrong end of a mistaken transaction or an unclear commercial arrangement. Um, but as always is the case, I again have a note of caution. Um, one of the judges here, Mr Justice Hildyard, made it clear that the decision aligned with commercial good sense and commercial morality. Uh, and so it appears that the court was particularly swayed by the purchaser's conduct when they realised the mistake and went on to sell the uh, assets at the true market value. Um, in addition, this case still highlights the risk, not least in terms of the potential costs of litigating, of failing to agree the subject matter and price of a transaction with sufficient clarity and recording it in writing. Um, just on that point, at the very least, if the contract had been in writing, the administrators of Lehman may have been able to rely on the doctrine of rectification um, to provide a more straightforward and potentially cheaper remedy for a common mistake. Finally, for this section, I just wanted to mention, um, the next slide please, a recent case on severance. Um, as Dan said earlier on, this isn't a webinar on employment contracts per se, um, but I wanted to raise this case here because it's an interesting one, highlighting circumstances where a court would sever an unenforceable obligation without affecting the validity of other restrictions. So uh, this case involved the consideration of Mrs Tillman's uh, employment contract, which included a number of restrictive covenants preventing her from working for a competitor. One of the restrictions attempted to stop Mrs Tillman being interested in a competing business and the question to be considered ultimately by the Supreme Court was whether this was an unlawful restraint of trade capable of being severed from the agreement, leaving the other restrictions intact. Obviously, the employer was really keen that the other restrictions remained intact in terms of competition. Um, the court was prepared to sever the words, um, and particularly the words interested in, um, and reaffirmed the test for severance as set out in the Beckett Investments case, namely that an unenforceable provision could be removed, firstly, where it didn't require changes to any of the remaining terms. The remaining terms were adequately supported by the remaining consideration, um, and the contract's character and purpose would not be altered by the removal of that provision as a result. So a case that indicates that the court may be prepared to consider severance. Um, this case draws my section on implied terms and interpretation to a close. Um, just to sum up, hopefully you'll see from the cases that although the court has a stated reluctance to interfere with business arrangements, it will approach interpretation of contracts and implying missing terms with business efficacy at the forefront of his mind. Um, notwithstanding this approach, there really is no substitute for ensuring that all material terms of your business arrangements are agreed um, and recorded in writing before any work or services are carried out, goods are provided or money spent.
Um, at the very least, it could save you the cost of litigating to get the court to endorse a review of what the contract covered um, and protect your rights and obligations. Um, I'm going to pass now to Dan and he's going to look at some specific developments regarding relational contracts um, and in particular implied duties of good faith that have become very popular um, in our contractual arrangements. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Hannah. I suppose popular is uh, one way to describe them. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Thank you. Yes. Now, uh, anyone who's been following the development of English contract law over the far, over the last few years will be familiar with uh, Lord Justice Leggett and his his one man crusade to introduce a general good general duty of good faith into English contract law um, from cases like Yam Seng and ITC et al. Um, this all came to a head rather in uh, Bates and the Post Office. Now, th there was a lot of publicity around this, uh, and rightly so. It, it is a, an absolute scandal. Uh, and, and you might consider that uh, perhaps uh, Justice Fraser in this case might have stretched the law a little bit in order to try to do justice, because what this case concerned was several hundred sub postmasters who had had in some cases quite substantial sums of money clawed back from them by the post office um, and in some cases had had lost their post office contract and in some cases had actually been sent to prison for for fraud uh, on the basis of what turned out to be a series of computer errors in a very expensive and problematic new computer system that the post office had introduced called Horizon. Now, when Horizon was introduced, the post office had issued uh, what it called rather hilariously its network transformation contract, uh, which was the usual thing that big businesses tend to shove onto small ones. It was horrifically one sided, it essentially let the post office do whatever it pleased. Uh, and, and amongst other things, it required the sub postmasters to account for any and all losses and discrepancy, discrepancies, regardless of how caused. So if there if there's a, a problem in the tally, that is the sub postmaster's problem. And on the face of the contract, doesn't really matter that that might actually be the post office's fault because their computer system that they require the sub postmasters to use doesn't work. Now, given that, what Justice Fraser did was he took he took Leggett's reasoning in cases like Yam saying and ran with it. Uh, and what he seems to have settled on is a, a subset of commercial contracts called the relational contract. And whether a contract is a relational contract uh, is determined rather by by the circumstances of the relationship. But if it is a relational contract, then it is open. To the court to imply into it duties of good faith. Um, we can and what he did was set out uh, what he turns some hallmarks of a relational contract. And if we could have the next slide, please. Uh, of which there were nine. The first one that the contract doesn't expressly say that there is no implied duty of good faith uh, is absolutely determinative. In other words, if the contract says there is no implied duty of good faith in this contract, then that is the end of the matter. It's not a relational contract. Uh, otherwise, the other eight factors are all just indicative. Interestingly, uh, although uh, Fraser did touch on the fact that there was clearly an enormous imbalance of bargaining power between the post office and the sub postmasters uh, that wasn't in his view one of the hallmarks of a relational contract rather we're talking about something that is you know, a long-term collaborative arrangement which perhaps can't be entirely expressed can't be in the words of i forget who it was um reduced to a certainty and written down in black and white because it's a bit more amorphous than that. Um, if it requires, you know, cooperate, cooperative and predictable behaviour, uh, there might be 
a requirement that both of you have to put put quite a bit of money or risk quite some, quite a bit. Uh, there might be some element of exclusivity, but all of these are just hallmarks. Um, but if if these if these hallmarks tend to indicate that this is a contract which is a relational contract, then it is open to the court to imply in terms, additional terms, uh, on the basis of this being a relational contract. And if we can have the next slide, the, the precise content of those terms is going to vary according to the type of contract that it is. Uh, in Bates, um, on the basis of its being a relational contract, um, Fraser felt able to imply these terms in, not to suspend the sub postmasters arbitrarily, irrationally or capriciously, uh, not to suspend them without reasonable proper cause, uh, and not to suspend them in circumstances where the post office was itself in, in a material breach of duty. Uh, and on that, I should mention that uh, on another of the issues being decided in this case, uh, it was held that uh, the uh, terms implied into the agreement by the Supply of Goods and Services Act applied in respect of um, the post office's provision of the Horizon computer system such that they had to exercise reasonable skill and care in, in its provision and operation. Similarly, they mustn't terminate in any of those ways. And if they've got a, a contractual power or discretion, they have to exercise it honestly, in good faith, for the purpose for which it exists. And if they have a discretion not to exercise it arbitrarily, capriciously or unreasonably. In other words, not to stick their fingers in their ears and go la 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 when the hundreds of sub postmasters are telling them that Horizon's broken and instead just demand that uh, the sub postmasters make up the, uh, the shortfall out of their own pocket. Which is kind of the leading case on this. And if we can have the next slide. We have had quite a few cases subsequently which have followed Bates. Um, we've had New Balance Athletics and Liverpool Football Club, which concerned uh, rights to sell Liverpool branded you know, football kit and stuff. Um, in which um, the the test applied was actually slightly different to Bates and they would what they were looking at. No, I'm sorry, the I got that wrong. The they, they applied the hallmarks set out in Bates, but the content of the duty was held in the circumstances to be slightly different. And it came down to not behaving in a way that reasonable people would find commercially unacceptable or not faithful to the party's bargain. Uh, equally, we've had um, Essex County Council and UBB Waste, uh, which incidentally is probably decent authority for the proposition that an entire agreement clause on its own is not going to meet that first hallmark which is determinative of of express terms ousting the duty of good faith um but the one i really wanted to pick up on uh, and i'm conscious of time but the one i really wanted to pick up on was utb and sheffield united um because this concerned i'm i don't know how many people listening follow football but if you do you'll be aware of the long-standing wrangling over the ownership and control of sheffield united football club between a bloke called Kevin McCabe and a member of the Saudi royal family. Um, but this concerned the investment and shareholders agreement and its interpretation and application when uh, this Saudi prince had first made his investment into the club. Uh, and without going into the details, suffice it to say, relations deteriorated such that uh, each of them tried to exercise their call options on the other to buy the other one out. Um, and the case is not interesting so much for its facts as for the fact that the judge said that notwithstanding that this is a, a long term relationship, that of itself is not enough to tip this over into being a, a relational contract. And in fact, the judge seemed to slightly doubt, doubt whether Bates really was authority for the proposition of the existence of relational contract in English law. Uh, judge observed that the law has not actually yet reached a settled state of clarity. Uh, and some of the observations that the judge made were that this is 
this is for there that this is a a contract which has been which is detailed and very specific uh, and was professionally drafted and professionally negotiated uh, and it sets out a, a fairly sophisticated and fairly complex mix of fairly unequal rights and obligations uh, for two parties who did in some respects have conflicting interests uh, even at the outset uh, and it was drafted in such a way that actually it could work on its terms perfectly well without implying duties of good faith into it. And so for that reason, this was, even though this is a, a long-term agreement uh, that you know arguably sets out a long-term relationship in which there will, all things being equal, be a be a, a spirit of, of reciprocity and cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that wasn't enough. So shareholders agreements of that type, probably not relational contracts. And I think if we have the next slide, that kind of brings that little horror show to the end. Uh, I think the next slide I now hand, no, I don't hand back over to Hannah yet, do I? This one's me, isn't it? I do apologize. Uh, this is a relatively quick one. Um, but it's just a, a salutary reminder. We, we talk an awful lot in contracts about material breach uh, and all sorts of things are triggered by material breach. Uh, and often, you know, if you, you've all seen the clauses where party A can terminate for party B's material breach, which party B hasn't cured within X period. Um, this was a contract for the provision of, of financial investment services or, or financial advisory services of some sort. I forget the details, um, but the crux of it was that a uh, consultant wasn't doing what he was supposed to do under the contract and he had verbally expressed a an intention not to, uh, whereupon whereupon client wrote to them and said, right, well, under this clause of the contract, we're putting you on however many days notice it is that you're in material breach of contract and you now need to cure it within this period. And he wrote back and said, yes, very well, I, I, I withdraw my statement saying I'm not going to provide these services. Now, that wasn't enough to cure the breach. Because on the fact the breach wasn't just his his statement of intent not to perform. He actually wasn't performing. And he didn't actually start performing again. He just said, yes, I will. And they did nothing. So that wasn't enough to cure the breach. And he was in material breach of contract and the contract was terminable because he had not cured it. The point here, I suppose, is that as with so many things, uh, termination on grounds of material breach and whether it is curable and if so what it will take actually to cure it is very very fact specific and the courts can and will carry out a detailed analysis of the facts. So I suppose the takeaway from this section is if you don't want to create a relational contract say so in terms your entire agreement clause will probably not be enough. Uh, and if you're going to claim that you're curing a material breach, then make sure you actually are curing the breach complained of. On that bombshell, I think now I do actually hand back to Hannah. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I'm a bit conscious of time. If we could move to the next slide. And um, really the, the last couple of slides on our section are, are a quick gallop through some recent cases on governing law and jurisdiction clauses um, and also, they could also contractually agreed dispute resolution clauses, including arbitration clauses. Um, and in here we're seeing a slightly stricter approach, I think, um, with the court and the court um, is not particularly wanting to intervene with what the parties agree in this regard. Um, the first case on there, um, we've got the Enker case against the insurance company Chubb. Um, in this situation, in, in this case, we were looking at an arbitration agreement um, um, and it was unclear what the governing law of that arbitration agreement actually was. 
Unfortunately, uh, the contract between the parties did not expressly state which law governed the contract overall. Um, there were some various references to Russian law um, and the dispute had aris arisen from a fire which damaged a power plant in Russia, um, which was insured by Chubb. Chubb, um, as a result, were trying to contend that Russian law governed the contract, including the arbitration clause. Um, and the Supreme Court found that the references to Russian law, quite frankly, did not point to the conclusion that the parties intended Russian law to actually apply, um, particularly to the arbitration agreement. Um, and they found instead, actually, that there was no express or implied choice of law, and therefore um, the arbitration agreement should actually be governed by the law of the arbitration seat, which was defined in the clause, which in this case was English law. Um, so uh, the takeaway from this one really is that um, you, you need to make sure that you get certainty um, with your express choice of law um, and by doing that, stating it within all your contracts. Um, and if you want to use an arbitration ag uh, agreement, um, you should be really clear within that arbitration agreement which governing law the parties have agreed to apply um, to any ensuing arbitration should your relationship break down. Uh, moving quickly to the final slide, um, we can see that certainty is also important in the context of other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. So quickly, the Taylor Wimpy case, uh, the clause here, the ADR clause here, required any dispute to be referred to expert determination. Harren Holmes did indeed refer it to expert determination, but Taylor Wimpy wanted to commence TCC proceedings instead um, and also wanted to gather documents to support its case and so therefore made an application for pre-action disclosure. Um, here the court said, no, it's not appropriate for us to exercise our discussion, discretion to make such an order. Um, actually, all the other conditions for a pre-action disclosure application were met, um, but the court said that actually to intervene here would run the real risk of frustrating what the parties had contractually agreed. Um, and the dispute should have been referred to expert determination, and it was, and they would not interfere with that agreement. Secondly, really quickly, the Chemi Tech case. Um, here we've got an exclusive arbitration clause. Um, um, and the question was whether that prevented a party obtaining interim relief from the court. Um, contract was governed by English law. Um, it contained an agreement to arbitrate um, exclusively in London under ICC rules. Um, steps were taken to commence that arbitration, um, but then Chemi Tech went and issued a claim for interim security in the UAE. Um, on an application from SRA Middle East um, to the commercial court, uh, the commercial court agreed with their argument and said they simply would not interfere because to do so could potentially amount to a breach of the arbitration agreement. So to sum up these cases, they really emphasise the need to consider these types of clauses really carefully during any contractual negotiation. And in particular, um, what's really important is to ensure that your ADR clause is bespoke and responds effectively to the specific situation should your contractual relationship break down in the future. Once a party has contractually agreed to resolve a dispute through ADR or arbitration, the court's view is that generally um, this should not be ignored or circumvented in the future without the other side's agreement. So it's really important to consider what works best for your particular relationship in advance and document it clearly. Further, no deal Brexit potentially looming and no real certainty yet around what regimes will apply post 31 December from a governing law or choice of jurisdiction perspective. This is also another reason not to ignore these clauses and to make sure they're fit for purpose by reference to the particular relationship in question. So that brings our roundup of recent uh, case law to a close, um, in particular highlighting when the English courts will intervene in B2B contacts, um, uh, contracts and when they won't. So I'm now going to pass to Catherine um, and she's going to talk about the latest developments in statutory intervention in the form of the platform to business regulations. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so yes, as, as Hannah said, I'm going to be talking about the platform to business regulations. Uh, in the interest of time, this, this will be a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, so if you do have questions, please feel free to, to drop them in the chat. And if we can move to the next slide, please. So P2BR, what is it? Um, it is an EU regulation which came into force on the 12th of July. Um, there has been a draft Brexit statutory instrument uh, which has been published 
Um, so that has given greater clarity on the long term application of what the P2BR will look like in the UK after the transition period. Um, the majority of changes replace references to the EU um, and EU law with ones to the UK. Um, I will touch on a, a couple of, of other major changes to the extent that they are that major as we go through. Um, the whole point of the P2BR is to promote fairness and transparency for business users of what we call online intermediation services to address a perceived imbalance in the relationship between online platforms and the businesses which provide goods and services on them. So just to give some context around that, you could say that the success of an online business could be determined or partly determined by user fees that they might be required to pay and, and the online platform's ranking system, which determines how easily consumers can find the business in the first place. So can we move to the next slide, please? OK, so what does the P2BR do? Well, it introduces firstly a ban on certain unfair practices by online platforms. So that could include things like suspension or termination of a seller's account without clear reasons, uh, failure to provide terms and conditions in plain and intelligible language, and failure to give adequate notice for changes to terms and conditions. Um, the next thing it introduces is transparency requirements. So both online platforms and online search engines will have to disclose the main parameters used to rank goods and services on their site. Um, and I'll cover um, off what, what these look like in a bit more detail uh, later on. Um, disclosure of, of advantages is an interesting one. So platforms must disclose any advantage given to their own products over others and explain what data they collect and how they share and use it. Um, there's a new uh, complaint handling procedure for business users. Um, so platforms will have to offer mediation op options to businesses. Um, we'll cover that off again a bit, a bit in a bit more detail later. Um, and there is this enforcement for non-compliance aspect. Um, under the EU reg, uh, there was uh, a note about uh, the establishment of public um, public bodies uh, which would govern and, and enforce compliance of the, the regulations. Uh, the UK P2B reg removes references to public bodies in that context and enforcement will be through the courts. Uh, but what it basically means is that organisations and associations legitimately representing business users uh, have the right to take action before competent courts to enforce the, the P2BR. If we can move to the next slide, please. OK, so before we talk a little bit uh, about whether or not the P2BR will apply, um, I just want to take you through a couple of key definitions. Um, and the first one is uh, what we mean by online intermediation services. So under the P2B regs, um, this is defined as services which meet all of the following. And again, this is relevant because um, if you if you are an online intermediation service, then it, it's, it's possible that the P2B regs will apply to you. So online intermediation services are services which meet all of the following. So it constitutes information society services. And of course, it, it references a, 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 another act for you to go and look up the definition. But essentially, an information society service is any service that's normally provided for enumeration at a distance by electronic means and at the individual request of a recipient of recipient services. Essentially, that means that most online services are an, an information society service, including apps, programs and many websites, including search engines, social media platforms, online messaging or internet based voice telephony services, online market services, online games, news and educational websites and, and so on and so forth. Um, the services must allow business users to offer goods or services to consumers with a view to facilitating the initiating of direct transactions between those business users and consumers. And services uh, must be provided to business users on the basis of contractual relationships between the provider of those services and business users which offer goods or services to consumers. Um, and when we talk about um, just on the, the information society service, when we talk about uh, what we mean by um, an individual request. It just means that the individual request means that the service is provided through the transmission of data on an individual request. OK, and if we can move to the next slide, we'll, just, we'll explore the definition of an online search engine under the P2B regs. So this one's much more straightforward. 
Um, this is a digital service that allows users to input queries in order to perform searches of, in principle, all websites or websites in a particular language on the basis of a query on any subject in the form of a keyword and so on and so forth. So typical definition of, of what you'd expect an online search engine to be. OK, so let's uh, move on to the next slide and we can talk a little bit more about the application. So uh, P2BR applies to we just, we just touched on these definitions and online intermediation services, um, marketplaces, app stores, sorry, online marketplaces, app stores and social media platforms are explicitly called out um, as, as online intermediation services which are caught by the P2BR. Anything else is really going to turn on its facts um, and you, you'd have to look at the elements of the definition that we just went through and, and, and determine whether, you, whether your business is a, an online intermediation service um, pursuant to the, the P2BR. Um, it also applies to online search engines and respect to their businesses and corporate users, but it's important to note that the regs only directly apply to search engines with respect to Article 5 and Article 7. And again, I, I will talk about these in a bit more detail on the next slide. Um, so in terms of territorial effect, um, it will apply to online interme intermediation services and online search engines, irrespective of the place of establishment or residence where they offer services to business users and corporate website users which are established or resident in the EU. And of course, UK B2BR is irrespective of whether they're located in the UK. Um, and, and which offer goods or services to consumers located in the EU, UK through the online platforms or search engines. So the change to the territorial scope from the end of the Brexit transition period means that businesses located outside the UK but contracting with a UK platform to sell to UK consumers will not be within the scope of the UK P2BR. Um, what doesn't it apply to? So um, it doesn't apply to business to consumer users. It's, it's between business to business businesses only. Um, it also does not apply to online payment services, online advertising tools or online advertising exchanges, which are not provided with the aim of facilitating the initiation of direct transactions and which do not involve a contractual relationship with a consumer. So it's, it's more of a pass through service. Okay, if we can move to the next slide, we can unpack what that actually means. So if you do determine that the P2BR does apply to you, um, things you should look at is to update your terms and conditions um, with uh, the, the following in line with the following articles. But I should also just caveat that this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, these are just some of the ones that I thought would be helpful on my whistle stop tour uh, to, to cover. Um, so let's unpack a few, a few of these. So Article 3 covers the supply of terms and conditions and mandatory information requirements. So under this article, um, OIS providers need to provide their business users with easily, access, easily available, including pre-contract, terms and conditions which must be written in plain and intelligible language. Uh, must include grounds for decisions to terminate or suspend or otherwise restrict provision of services to business users, information about any other distribution channels that online uh, intermediation services provider may use to distribute goods and services, and general information regarding any impact of the terms and conditions on ownership and control of intellectual property rights. So that's pretty much standard stuff. Um, in terms of the enforcement, non-compliant terms and conditions uh, will be deemed null and void um, if, you are, if, if your terms and conditions are found to uh, be in breach of, of the regulations under Article 3. Um, moving on to Article 4, restrictions, suspension and termination. So where an, an online intermediation service provider decides to restrict or suspend its services in respect of a business unit's, user's individual goods or services, it must provide the business user with a statement of its reasons prior to or at the time of the termination or restriction. Where an OIS provider decides to terminate the provision of its services to a business user, it must give 30 days notice and supply a statement of reasons for the decision. Um, and crucially, the, the provider must allow the business user to go through um, a complaints handling procedure, um, which I'll cover off in, in, a, in a bit more detail at the end. Um, this will not, so Article 4 will not apply uh, where the OIS provider is subject to a legal or regulatory obligation not to disclose such information. 
or where the provider can demonstrate the business user has repeatedly breached its terms and conditions. So um, if, if you do have, um, if you are a, an online intermediation service provider and you do have a business user which repeatedly breaches the terms and conditions of your agreement, you, you, you are able to, to terminate and suspend services. Uh, okay, so uh, Article 3 ranking. This one um, applies to both online uh, intermediation service providers and also online search engines. So OIS providers must set out the main parameters determining ranking and the reasons for their relative importance in their terms and conditions. And online search engines must provide an easily and publicly available description in plain and intelligible language on their search engines of the main parameters which individually or collectively are the most significant in determining ranking and their relative importance. Um, and, and both um, OIS providers and online search engines must include a description of the influence on ranking of any available direct or indirect remuneration me mechanisms. Um, moving on to Article 7, um, differentiated treatment. Um, online intermediation service providers may not impose Sorry, um, Article 7, OAS providers and online search engines must include in their terms and conditions a description of any differential treatment that they give or may give in relation to goods or services they or a business they control offer to consumers on the one hand and those of their business users on the other hand. Um, so if they promote their, their goods and services above their business users, for example, they have to include a description of any differential treatment um, and, and, and the reasons for that. Article 8, uh, specific contractual terms. So this, this, this only applies to um, OIS providers um, and they may not impose retroactive changes unless they were required to do so due to regulation or they are beneficial to business users. Um, they also have to explain what access, if any, business users have to information provided or generated by them, um, but which might be retained by the OS provider after termination. Um, so that, that one, again, is, is relatively standard, um, especially in terms of, of, of uh, being commercial. Um, Article 9, uh, access to data. Uh, online information, uh, online intermediation service providers must include a description in the terms and conditions of the access of their business users to personal and or other data generated by business users or consumers through their provisional use of the services on the platform. Um, moving on to Article 10, restrictions on selling. So if the OIS provider restricts business users from offering the same goods and services to consumers under different terms and conditions through other means, they must include the reasons for the restrictions in their terms and conditions and make the grounds for the restriction publicly available. Um, article uh, 12, um, so this is mediation. Uh, OIS providers must identify two or more mediators with whom they are willing to engage in their terms and conditions. And where mediation is used, the OIS provider must bear a reasonable proportion of the costs. Uh, so those are some articles that you need to think about um, when you when you look at updating your terms and conditions in line with the PTBR. Um, and then lastly, that, let's touch on this, this new concept of a complaints procedure. Um, so Article 11 uh, dictates that OIS providers must provide an internal complaints procedures uh, for business users. And, and note that this doesn't apply to OIS providers, which are small enterprises. And again, that will turn on its facts as to whether you are a, a small enterprise or not. Um, so the complaints procedure, it must be easily accessible, free, provide resolution within a reasonable time and operate on the principles of transparency and equal treatment for equal situations. The process should deal with complaints in relation to non-compliance by the provider with the P2BR, technological issues interfering with the platform, measures taken or behaviour by the provider, which relates to the provision of the services, and which directly affects the relevant business user. Um, so that concludes my, my very, very whistle stop tour of the P2BR regs, just uh, having regard to the time that we have available. Um, and as I said at the start, if you do have any questions, please feel free to, to pop them into the chat or, or follow up on, um, offline afterwards. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Andrew to talk to you about the ITSO facto clauses. Thank you, Catherine.
Um, we've run well over our lot of time. Um, we've only had one question so far, so I will attempt to give you a high level view on ipso facto clauses and the impact of SEGA um, in the next five minutes. So what are ipso facto clauses? Effectively, an ipso facto clause in this context is a clause that operates automatically um, in, the, um, in certain circumstances. If we could have the next slide, please. So these are not actually unfamiliar um, within the context of insolvency. Um, as Dan mentioned earlier, freedom to contract has been imposed by statute and under section 233 of the Insolvency Act 1986, um, utility suppliers were required to continue to supply to businesses even in the event of insolvency. Now that actually wasn't um, so controversial at the time because all of the utilities were nationalised industries. Um, so effectively the government was legislating for its own industries. That was then expanded in 2015 by introducing a further essential supply, which, was an, which were IT supplies, such as POS systems, website hosting, etc. Um, the Corporate Insolvency Governance Act, which was introduced earlier this year and is in force, introduced a further section, section 233A, which expanded um, the restrictions um, to effectively outlaw termination by suppliers um, and extended that definition of suppliers to include private utility suppliers um, and all suppliers of goods and services. Next slide, please. So when do these provisions apply? The provisions apply when an insolvency event occurs. Um, so bear in mind we're talking about B2B, we're not talking about personal insolvency, we're talking about corporate insolvency. So that would include administration, liquidation, company voluntary arrangement, and the new procedure of moratorium, which is introduced by the CGAR. Now moratorium will often be seen as a lead into a further insolvency event, but it is also possible to have a standalone moratorium without ultimately a further insolvency event. What it doesn't include are schemes of arrangement. So essentially under section under, under the new section 233, um, a supplier of goods and services can't insist on the payment of a pre-insolvency debt, even though they're being asked to continue to supply. So you're supplying goods or services to the company, that an insolvency event happens in relation to that company, you're not allowed to terminate as a result of the insolvency event and must continue supplying goods and services, and you're not entitled to impose as a precondition that any outstanding payments are met before you continue to supply. Also, you're not um, allowed to insist on a personal guarantee in relation to that continued supply. Under the old provisions, um, the office holder could be required to provide a personal guarantee, so the supplier had some comfort um, that the payments would be met. So, what are the issues that that throws up? Um, well, just be aware, it doesn't include all goods and service supplies. There are exclusions for regulated industries, um, but they tend to be, this tends to be around insurance and financial companies. So in the ordinary course, most supply of goods and services will be caught by these provisions. Um, the restrictions remain in place for the duration of the insolvency process, and you'll see it applies to goods and services. One of the questions is, for instance, would this apply to a lease? Um, and bear in mind there is almost no guidance um, supplied in relation to the interpretation of these provisions. So we are going to be learning as we go along through case law, should it reach the courts. Um, the general consensus at the moment is at least the, the rental, the lease itself is not a supply um, and therefore termination provisions don't fall foul of um, this provision within the Insolvency Act. However, often within leases you might have a separate um, service agreement, there might be a separate service charge whereby the landlord is providing maintenance, etc. That is likely to be subject to these provisions. So within a lease that could be part that is subject and part that isn't subject. One of the other issues is around construction um, and the interplay um, with other legislation. So for instance under section 112 of the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1996, um, parties have a right to suspend performance for non-payment, um, but it would appear that the CGAR is going to override um, that legislation. But again, there are going to be issues around 
um, interplay between legislation. You can terminate, however, if payments are not being made on an ongoing basis. So you can't insist on pre-insolvency event payments being made, but you can terminate for non-payment post-insolvency events. So you're not supplying goods and services for free or the goods and services don't have to be provided for free post-insolvency event, and you can terminate if payment isn't made in the ordinary, under, under your ordinary terms. Um, the only other relief that the supplier really has is in relation to hardship. So if you can satisfy, if you're the supplier and you can satisfy a court that you will suffer hardship by continuing this supply, um, then the courts um, can override the provisions within the legislation. Um, as, could I have the next slide, please? As I mentioned, there is almost no guidance um, and we don't know what the definition of hardship is. Um, does it mean that you that effectively the supplier will become insolvent if they have to continue supplying? Um, and the hardship there is to, as it says on the slide, to, to prevent the domino effect. So we've got a we've got a company that's insolvent. We've got a supplier, and if it continues to supply, will then become insolvent. The suppliers of that supplier may then become insolvent, and so on and so forth. Um, so there is a possibility of um, of applying for relief in certain circumstances, but we don't know what those circumstances currently are, other than the use of the word hardship. Um, so what are some possible solutions at the moment. Um, categorising late payment as a termination event and not, and not giving any option to remedy or any grace period. Um, having very strict payment terms um, and having a very effective credit control um, team who are keeping on top of payments so that you're not ending up with a, a bad debt prior to the insolvency event. Define the issues prior to the insolvency as grounds for termination so the um, ipso facto provisions relate to things like filing a notice of intention in relation to administration. So you could be looking at um, putting a wider definition around that, such as um, your, um, your customer is having financial difficulties. So, so think about defining uh, insolvency in a different way, if you like, um, so that you have the right to terminate pre the insolvency event itself. Um, Possibly look at using framework agreements so that each order constitutes a separate contract so you don't have that ongoing supply that you're terminating um, and then you're just doing it on a contract by contract basis. So that is effectively a very quick whistle top tour across ipso facto. As I said at the moment, for us it probably raises more questions than it answers. So we are expecting uh, a lot of questions um, coming up in the future. If you have any questions um, that you want to pick up with me afterwards, either by phone or email, um, more than happy to talk to you. Um, as I say at the moment, I will do my best to answer those questions based on current thinking, but we, we have almost no guidance and no case law um, to help us at the moment. So at this point, I'm going to hand back to Dan, um, who will deal with any questions. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, right, conscious we have gone slightly over time, which is probably my fault because I do have a tendency to uh, to ramble on. Um, there are a few questions which we will come back to you on offline. There's one I just wanted to flag though, because it's quite interesting. Uh, and it's this. Does the Lehman Brothers case give rise to a new concept of commercial morality? And does that support a concept of good faith? Uh, do you want to take a crack at that, Hannah? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the first thing that I would say is morality and fairness isn't particularly new concept when it comes to the courts and certain judges. So historically, um, there are examples of courts and particular judges um, who deliver judgments to rectify perceived unfairness. 
Um, I think that the cases I talked about today do show more of a willingness for um, the court to intervene in a contractual relationship um, using that business efficacy as a justification. Um, and I think it would say that where you have a relational contract, I think it does support potentially um, the fact that you might be able to get recourse for things that traditionally have been called sharp commercial practices. Um, but you need to show a relational contract um, and you need to be very clear on the facts of the particular situation um, as to actually what remedy you would ultimately receive. So I think the answer is yes, potentially there's certainly more of a willingness for courts to get involved and take a look at those contractual relationships and the aligned sharp commercial practices. Thanks, Hannah. I think we've just got uh, time for one more question, which is going back to the Bain case, what would cure the breach in that case? Um, I'm going to give the standard lawyer's answer and say it depends. Uh, in the Bain case, uh, what was said to be required to cure the breach was not simply a withdrawal of an intention to not continue performing, um, but actually to perform. So uh, within the, I believe it was a 21 day cure period uh, in that particular contract, uh, <clears throat> the, they would have had to not only say, yes, OK, very well, I, I withdraw my statement saying I, I intend to not comply with this contract, uh, but they would also have had to uh, actually perform the services contracted for or at least start performing them in order to have successfully cured it. Uh, again, what is going to be a cure is going to very much depend on the breach complained of and the facts surrounding it though. So I'm afraid it's an annoying lawyer's answer to that one. Now, I think that is probably all we have time for. If there are other questions, we will uh, come back to you offline on them. Um, I believe our uh, wonderful moderator, Gareth, has posted in the Q&A a link to our feedback survey, and we'd be very grateful if you could fill that out. Uh, there is also a link to our uh, Movember team. So if you've uh, enjoyed my ridiculous facial hair today, then if you do have a few quid to spare, they would be greatly appreciated uh, by those very deserving charities. And other than that, uh, it just remains for me to say on behalf of uh, all four of us, thank you all very much and uh, have a lovely day.